Chapter Seven of the Last Egyptian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Last Egyptian by L. Frank Baum. Chapter Seven. A Step Toward the Jail. Kara wandered about the streets. Cairo is a marvel to the most blasé traveller. It could not fail to impress an inexperienced native. But the Egyptian masked the astonishment under an expression cold and reserved, and a manner dignified and undemonstrative. No one must suspect he was fresh from the desert and the Nile country. The shops of the jewellers especially attracted his attention, and he stopped many times to examine the splendid gems displayed in the windows. Some were priced, and he wondered at their value. It is said that no capital in the world contains so many rare and costly gems as Cairo. In the evening he crossed the great bridge of Ismail Pasha to the island of Gizireh, staring at the procession of carriages, camels, automobiles and donkeys that at twilight followed on one another's heels. In the carriages and automobiles rode Syrians, Turks, Copts and Arabs, clothed in conventional European dress, save for the red fez everywhere prevalent the burnous and the native dress had been abandoned by these aristocrats and this met with kara's full approval he was not averse to innovations upon the ancient customs in which he had been reared if the dominant people of his country and age were english then the manners and customs of the english should be adopted by those who wished to compete with them in importance also he began to understand that it is more dignified to ride than to walk at gizireh he hailed a carriage and in it returned across the bridge avoiding the dust and heat and mingling with a procession of beautifully costumed women and handsomely dressed men his own costume was poor enough in comparison but his magnificent chain drew the eye of more than one curious observer and now cairo was ablaze with lights and the population seemed gathered upon the sidewalks before the cafes and restaurants. Kara discovered that he was hungry. He dismissed his carriage and seated himself at one of the outdoor tables, ordering liberal refreshment. Opposite him sat a young English girl with a vacant-faced man for escort. Kara, as he ate, examined this girl critically, for she was the first of her class he had seen at close range. Her dress was dainty and beautiful but she was not fat at all. She was vivacious, and talked and laughed with unrestrained liberty. She seemed to imagine herself on an equality with the man beside her, who, despite his inanity, was still a man. Altogether, Kara was disappointed in her, although his grandmother had warned him that the training of European women imbued them with peculiar ideas, to which he must defer in his association with them. As he watched the girl, Nephthys rose several degrees in Kara's estimation. Nephthys was certainly fat and soft of flesh, and she did not talk much. The possession of such a woman was quite desirable, and perhaps he had not paid an extravagant price for Nephthys after all. These independent, chattering Western women must be tolerated, however, until he had accomplished his mission, so it would be well to begin at once to study their ways. Presently someone touched his shoulder familiarly, causing Kara to shrink back with an indignant gesture. Tadros, the dragoman, stood smilingly beside him, more gorgeously arrayed than ever. Tadros was in an excellent humour. He had not been obliged to take his roll of papyrus to the museum for a market, but had disposed of it to a private collector for a price far exceeding his expectations, which had not been too modest. Altogether he had made an excellent trade and there might be other pickings in this unsophisticated fellow-townsman of his, whose very presence in Cairo was warrant that he had money to part with. Before accosting Cairo, the dragoman had observed the change in his appearance and demeanour. The former recluse was no longer disgustingly filthy, but seemed clean in person, and was gowned in a snowy and respectable burnous. The objectionable turban had given place to the fez, the red slippers were of excellent morocco best of all the chain around his neck was rich and heavy and of remarkable workmanship kara was not only presentable but his manner was dignified and well-bred 
all this indicated suddenly acquired wealth that mysterious old hatatcha must have left to her grandson much more than the papyrus rolls and although kara might endeavour to be secret and uncommunicative he was bound to betray himself before very long now was the heated term and even gay cairo was listless and enervated the dragoman would have ample leisure to pick this bone skilfully before the tourist season arrived kara's first angry exclamation was followed by a word of greeting he was glad tadros had found him for as yet he had secured no place of residence and the bigness of the city somewhat bewildered him in spite of his assumed reserve the dragoman agreed to take him to a respectable rooming-house much frequented by copts of the better class when they had arrived there kara's guide made a mystic sign to the proprietor who promptly charged his new guest double the usual rate and obtained it because the egyptian was unaware he was being robbed the room assigned him was a simply furnished box-like affair yet kara had never before occupied an apartment so luxurious he examined the door with care and was pleased to find that it was supplied with a stout bolt as well as a lock and key now said the dragoman it is yet early we have barely crossed the edge of the evening i will take you to the theatre to see the dancing girls and later to a house where they wager money upon a singular and interesting game of red and black we can afterward eat our supper at a restaurant and listen to a fine band composed of hungarian gipsies how will that suit you not at all replied kara coldly i am going to bed be here to receive my orders at seven o'clock in the morning tadros fairly gasped with astonishment seven o'clock is too early he said a little sullenly the city is asleep at that hour when does it awaken well the shops are open at about nine come to me then at nine good night this summary dismissal was a severe disappointment to the dragoman yet he had no alternative but to take his leave strange that kara had refused the dancing girls and the game table but perhaps he was really tired tadros must not expect too much from his innocent at first at nine o'clock the next morning he found the young egyptian had breakfasted and was impatiently awaiting him take me to the leading jeweller in town said kara the dragoman frowned but presently brightened again and took his employer to a second-rate shop where his commissions were assured not here said kara i have seen much better shops Tadros tried again, but with no better success, so he altered his plans and took Kara direct to Andalath's, trusting to luck to exact a commission afterward. Now then, he said briskly, what shall we examine first? But Kara ignored him, asking to see the proprietor in private. Mr. Andalath graciously consented to the interview, and when the Egyptian entered the great jeweller's private room, Tadros was left outside. Kara laid a splendid ruby upon the merchant's table. The latter pounced upon it with an eager exclamation. "'It is very old,' said the Egyptian. "'Tell me, sir, is there anyone in Cairo who can recut it in the modern fashion?' "'But it will be a shame to alter this exquisite gem,' protested Andalaft. "'It is the square, flat cutting of the ancients, and shows the stone to be absolutely pure and flawless. Such specimens are rare in these days.' let it alone kara shook his head with positiveness i must have it recut said he and by the best man obtainable ah that is van der veen the hollander he does all my important work but van der veen will himself argue against the desecration he is a man of judgment where can i find him asked the prince the merchant reflected i will give you a letter to him said he if the stone must be recut i want van der veen to do it himself he has three sons who are all expert workmen but no one in the world can excel the father he wrote the note addressed it and gave it to kara then he again picked up the ruby and examined it if you would but sell it he suggested with hesitation i could secure for you a liberal price the khedive has placed with me an order for a necklace of the ancient egyptian gems but in two years i have been unable to secure more than three stones none of which compare with this in size or beauty allow me 
he opened a drawer and displayed the three antique stones two emeralds and an amethyst kara smiled and putting his hand in a pocket underneath his burnous he drew out five more rubies but little inferior in size to the one he had first shown tell me said he what price will you pay for these to add to the khedive's necklace andalaft was amazed but concealed his joy and eagerness as much as possible carefully he examined the gems under a glass and then weighed each one in his scales i will give you said he after figuring a little four hundred pounds for the five stones kara shrugged his shoulders and picked up his rubies that may be the price for ordinary gems he remarked but their age and cutting give these an added value i am holding them at eight hundred pounds the merchant smiled it is easy to understand said he with politeness that you are a connoisseur of precious stones but because you love the antique your partiality induces you to place an undue value upon your rubies come let us say six hundred i will not bargain returned the egyptian nor do i urge you to buy if you cannot afford to pay my price i will keep the rubies and he made a motion to gather them up stay exclaimed the jeweller what does it matter the khedive wishes them and i must make the sacrifice for his pleasure with a hand he vainly endeavoured to render steady he wrote a cheque for the sum demanded and kara took it and went away andalaft had made an excellent bargain yet the egyptian for all his cleverness did not know that he had been victimised at the house of the diamond cutter on a quiet side street at the lower end of the muski kara had a long interview with van der veen and his three sons as a result they agreed after examining the magnificent diamonds shown them to devote their exclusive services to prince kara for a full year he promised to keep them busy with the work of recutting his collection of ancient gems afterward he sent tadros with notes to gerald winston and the banker informing them of his temporary address as he had promised then he had an excellent luncheon and smoked a cuban cigar in the afternoon he followed his imploring dragoman into several shops where he made simple purchases and returned early to his hotel to find winston impatiently awaiting him you must accompany me at once to see my friend professor daresi with whom i am already disputing concerning the new papyri he is much interested in your method of interpreting the manuscripts but requires a better proof of its accuracy than i can give him will you come it will give me pleasure answered kara he drove with winston to the curator's house his knowledge of the hieroglyphics was well founded and he was not averse to an argument with the two savants indeed they found his explanation so clear and concise that they were equally amazed and delighted the egyptian dined with them in a private room where the discussion could not be interrupted and it was late in the evening when he returned thoughtfully to his own humble lodging tadros said he find me a comfortable house in a good part of the city something like that of professor daresi will do it will cost a lot of money objected the dragoman never mind i will pay the price returned the prince haughtily so the next day tadros rented a furnished house near the esbekia gardens for twelve hundred piastres a month and charged kara two thousand piastres for it the prince moved in and for three or four weeks devoted himself to watching the van der veens recut his treasures to long conversations with those egyptologists who were spending the heated term in cairo and to a study of the collection of ancient relics in the great museum which maspero had founded under said pasha incidentally he observed the social life and manners of those with whom he came in contact and acquired a polish of his own in a surprisingly short period at the end of the month he returned to fedah taking his dragoman with him tadros went without protest for he was making excellent profits from his old-time friend and had perfected a system of robbery that almost doubled prince kara's expenses they travelled by train and crossed the river in a boat arriving in the evening at the tiny village tadros carried kara's travelling case and walked behind him as was fitting in a paid retainer and so they entered the narrow street of the village where all the dozen or so inhabitants stood in their doorways to stare and nod gravely at their returned fellow-citizens kara bade his dragoman leave the luggage in his own dwelling 
and seek a lodging for himself with old Neffert or Amenka. He then walked on to where Sarah and her daughter awaited him. He pinched Neffert's fat cheeks, felt of her round bare arms, and finally kissed her lips, declaring that she was steadily improving in condition and would put to shame many of the women of Cairo. Nephthys allowed the caresses listlessly, her eyes only brightening slightly when the gaily dressed dragoman came near and stood watching the proceedings. He wore a green jacket with gold embroidery today, and the girl observed it with evident approval. "'I sold her too cheaply, Kara,' replied the dragoman, stroking his thin moustache reflectively. "'In that I do not agree with you,' answered Kara. "'I will pay double the price for her return,' said Tadros. The girl is not for sale, and see here, my man, keep your hands off her while you are in Fedah, or I will be obliged to kill you. Never fear, I know my duties, replied the dragoman, turning on his heel. It would not be wise to offend Kara just now. The bone was not yet picked. Nephthys put on her spangled gown and sat upon Kara's knee, while her mother brought cakes and milk for their refreshment. Kara threw a chain of beads over the girl's head, and she laughed for very pleasure. Sarah felt of the beads and counted them. They were blue and had cost five piastres, but the two women were delighted with them and would enjoy their possession for many days. It was late when Kara left Sarah's hut. In the winter, said he, I will doubtless come for the girl and take her to Cairo. Then you shall have the rest of your money. Meantime, here is a bakshish to console you. He gave her a piece of gold, the first she had ever possessed, and went away to his dwelling. Nephthys, said the mother, I am proud of you. You have made us both rich. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of the Last Egyptian》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Last Egyptian》by L. Frank Baum — Chapter Eight — His Grandmother's Mummy When Feda seemed asleep, Kaira took the lamp and the bronze dagger from their hiding place and swung back the stone in the rear wall, passing through into the mountain cavern. Then, replacing the stone, he made his way along the crevasse, through the circular rock door into the arched passage, and down the ladder to the mummy chamber. Here he removed the lid of Atacha's mummy case and carefully dusted the interior. The forty days were ended. The case might have its occupant before morning. Within the splendidly carven casket, Kara found an oblong green stone with polished flat surfaces. On one of these surfaces was the cartouche of Atkare. The Egyptian examined this relic carefully and placed it in his pocket. It was the emerald that Atacha had promised the dwarf Sebet in payment for embalming her body. How Andalaf's eyes would sparkle could he but see this wonder. But this thought reminded Kara that he was loitering. He picked up his lamp and went to the mummy of Atachare, sliding back the slab of malachite and descending through the opening to the treasure chamber hidden below. His first act was to inventory carefully the contents of the twelve great vases that stood upon their alabaster pedestals. From these vases he abstracted choice specimens of emeralds, sapphires, diamonds, and rubies, filling with them several small leathern sacks he had brought concealed upon his person. Perhaps he had taken a fortune in this careless manner, but so vast was the treasure that the contents of the vases seemed scarcely disturbed. In one of the numerous jars resting upon the granite floor, and which had doubtless been added to the hoard at a much later period than that of Atkare, the Egyptian found a quantity of pearls, of a size and quality that rendered them almost peerless among the treasures of the world. The jar contained a full quart, and Kara took them all. At the moment he did not comprehend their value, though Atacha had told him that a single one of these pearls would be sufficient to ransom a kingdom. The gems he had already secured were enough to weigh heavily upon his person, but Kara was greedy. He examined the contents of many jars and vases, choosing here and there a jewel that appealed to his fancy, and adding to his selection a number of exquisite ornaments of wrought gold. But at last he was forced to admit that he had taken enough from the treasure chamber to answer his present purposes, and so he reluctantly returned to the vault above. 
As he closed the slab, his eye fell upon a strange jewel set in the mummy case of Atcaré. It was surrounded by a protecting band of chased gold, and sparkled under the rays of Kaver's lamp in a manner that distinguished it from any of the thousands of other gems that literally covered the mummy case of the great Egyptian. For at first this odd jewel had a dark, steely luster, which changed while Kaver's eyes rested upon it to a rich, transparent orange, and then to an opal ground with tongues of flame running through it. A moment later the color had faded to a dull gray, which gradually took on a greenish tinge. Kaira set down the lamp and pried the stone from its setting with the point of his dagger, placing it afterward in a secure inner pocket of his robe. As he did so, a golden bust of Isis that stood upon the mummy case toppled and fell to the pavement, and from a hollow underneath of the bust rolled a small manuscript of papyrus. This Kaira took also, and replaced the bust in its former position. His nerves must have been of iron, for the uncanny incident had not even startled him. Now he made his way back to the entrance and along the passage, finally emerging with his treasure into the room that had been his former dwelling-place. All was silent and dark. A mild bray from the blind Nico's donkey was occasionally heard, and at times the faraway hoot of a desert owl. But those within the village seemed steeped in slumber. Kayra divided his burden by placing the greater part in his travelling case, which he locked securely. Then he reclined upon the rushes, and was about to compose himself to sleep when the mat across the archway was thrust aside, and Sebet entered. I am here, most royal one, he announced. Kaira sat up. And my grandmother? he inquired. Here also, my prince. Ah, how natural is Hatacha! You will be delighted. It is a skillful and almost perfect piece of work, even though I praise my own craft in saying so. With these words, the dwarf led in the donkey. Upon its back was the form of a swaddled mummy, which was bound to a flat plank to hold it rigidly extended. I will show you the face continued Sebet in an eager tone as he lifted the mummy and placed it upon the ground. Do not trouble yourself, said Kara. I will look upon my grandmother at my leisure. The night is waning. Take your price and go your way. He handed the dwarf the emerald, holding the lamp which he had relighted, while Sebet examined the stone with great care. Yes, it is the great emerald with the cartouche of Atcaré, said the embalmer in a low, grave voice. Osiris be praised that at last it is my own. Hatacha was a wise woman, and she kept her word. Kaira extinguished the light, but the moon was shining and sent some of its rays through the arch to relieve the gloom. Good night, said he. The dwarf stood still, thinking deeply. Finally, he said, glancing at the mummy, Where will my old friend repose? It is her secret, returned the prince brusquely. She trusted you not to ask questions. And yourself? Will you not wish to be mummified when your course is run? Kara laughed. Ah, my Sevet, are you a mortal? he asked. Do you expect to live to embalm all the generations? You made a mummy of my great-grandmother and of my grandmother. Your hairs are now white. Be content, and think upon your own future. That has already occupied my mind, answered the dwarf quietly. Farewell, then, prince of the royal line. Your ancestors thought first of the tomb, then of the life preceding it. You are indulging in life, with no thought of the tomb and resurrection. It is the new order of things, the trend of a civilization that forgets its dead and hides the silent ones in the earth, that they may putrefy and decay and become mere dust. Very well, the age is yours, not mine. May Osiris guide thy life, my prince. He turned to his donkey and led the ghost-like animal out into the night. Kara stood still, and in a moment he could hear their footsteps no longer. Then he secured the mat before the arch, and for a second time swung back the stone in the wall. This done, he felt in the dusk for the mummy of Atacha, and lifting it into his arms, bore it through the opening, and replaced the stone. The body was heavy, and he panted as he paused to light his lamp. It was nearly an hour before Kara, weary and perspiring, finally deposited the mummy of his grandmother beside its elaborately constructed case. He then unfastened the straps that bound it to the board, and by exercising great care, succeeded in placing the body in its coffin without breaking or injuring it. Next, he removed the outer strips of linen that swathed the head until the outlines of Atasha's face showed clearly through its mask of tightly drawn bandages. Then he stood aside, and holding up the lamp, gazed long and earnestly upon the calm features. I promised, he murmured, here to repeat my oath, that I will show no mercy to any one of Lord Rowan's family. 
that I will hunt them down, every one, as a tiger hunts his prey, and crush and humble them in the eyes of all men, that not one shall finally escape my vengeance, and that all shall know in the end that it was Hitacha who destroyed them. So be it. By Amen Re, the sun god who gave me being, by Atkare, whose blood now courses through my veins, by my hope of peace on earth and in the life to come, I swear that Hitacha's will shall be obeyed. His voice was cold and even of tone, his face grave but unmoved. He placed his hand upon the breast of the mummy and repeated the mystic sign that he had used at her deathbed. This done, he raised the heavy carved lid of the case and placed it in position. Next morning, Kaber gave Nephthys a kiss and returned across the river on his way to Cairo. The dragoman carried the traveling bag and grumbled at its weight. He was in a bad humor. It is all very well to make money, and Kaber is a veritable mine. But had Tadros realized that Nephthys was so fat and flabby, it would have required much more than a roll of papyrus to induce him to part with her. True, he had managed, while her master was asleep, to stealthily meet the girl and embrace her. But he lacked the satisfaction that exists in proprietorship. One should be careful about selling young women. They are like untried camels, liable to develop unexpected and valuable qualities. These reflections engrossed the dragoman all the way to Cairo. But there were other things to demand his attention. Prince Kaira announced his intention of taking the next steamer to Naples, and then travelling to Paris and London. He asked Tadros to accompany him. "'But that is impossible,' was the reply. "'I am a dragoman of Egypt, the chief of my profession, a guide unequalled for knowledge, intelligence, and fidelity in all the land. But take me away from my own country, and what am I? Take me from the poor tourists, and what will become of them?' I need you in Europe to do things in my service that I would not dare propose to anyone else. I believe, said the prince coolly, that you are an unprincipled scoundrel. You lie easily and without hesitation. You rob me cheerfully every day that you are in my employ. You have no conscience and no morality, except that you are afraid of the law. I have studied your character with care, and I have estimated it aright. Tadros looked first shamefaced, then humble, then indignant. "'By every god of Egypt!' he cried earnestly. "'I am an honest man!' "'That is proof of my assertion to the contrary,' replied the unmoved Kara. "'Now, I need a scoundrel to assist me, and you are the man of my choice. "'Continue to fleece me, if you like. I do not mind. "'But if you serve me faithfully in some delicate matters that will soon require my attention, "'I will make you the richest dragoman alive, "'so that Rashid and the Hayeks will all turn green with envy.' On the other hand, should you choose to betray me, you will not require riches, for the nether world has no commerce. Tadros thought it over. We are Egyptians, he said at last. Your enemies are equally mine. Very well. Command, and I will obey. Are you not a prince of my people? And why should I ever wish to betray you? Because wise men sometimes become fools. In your case, a lapse from wisdom means death. Others may bribe you with an equal amount of money, but I alone will extract the penalty for betrayal. I think you will remain wise. Ah, that is certain, my prince, declared Tadros with conviction. And so Kara sailed from Alexandria, taking with him the great diamonds which the van der Veens had already recut, the wonderful pearls which no eye but his had yet beheld, and the priceless treasures of Atkare. The dragoman followed him, humble and obedient. End of chapter 8. Recording by Todd. Chapter 9 of The Last Egyptian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ian Stewart, Rosanna, Victoria, Australia. THE LAST EGYPTIAN by L. Frank Baum CHAPTER NINE CHAPTER NINE Aneth. 
Charles Consinor, ninth Earl of Roane, was considerably discouraged at the moment when Luke the butler placed the big blue government envelope upon his table, thoughtfully leaving it at the top of the daily heap of missives from impatient creditors. During a gay and dissipated life, his lordship had seen the ample fortune left him by his father gradually melt away, until now, in his old age, he found it difficult to secure sufficient funds to enable him to maintain a respectable position in the world. He had been ably assisted in his extravagances by his only son, the Viscount Roger Consinor, who for twenty years past had performed his full share in dissipating the family fortunes. Apart from their mutual prodigality, however, the two men had little in common. The father was reckless, open-handed, and careless of consequences, indulging himself frankly in such dissipations as most men are careful to hide. The son was reserved and sullen, and posed as a man eminently respectable, confining his irregularities mainly to the gaming table. Between them they had loaded the estates with mortgages, and sold every stick and stone that could be sold. At last the inevitable happened, and they faced absolute ruin. There seemed no way out of their difficulties. The Viscount had unfortunately married a wife with no resources whatever, although her family connections were irreproachable. The poor Viscountess had been a confirmed invalid ever since her baby girl was born, some eighteen years before, and was merely tolerated in the big half-ruined London mansion, being neglected alike by her husband and her father-in-law, who had both come to look upon her as a useless encumbrance. More than that, they resented the presence of a young, awkward girl in the house, and for that reason banished Aneth at twelve to a girls' school in Cheshire, where she remained practically forgotten until her eighteenth year. Then the lady preceptress shipped her home because her tuition fee was not promptly paid. Aneth found her mother so confirmed in the selfish habits of the persistent invalid that the girl's society, fresh and cheery though it proved, only irritated her nerves. She found her father, the morose Viscount, absolutely indifferent and unresponsive to her desire to be loved and admitted into his companionship. But old Lord Roane, her grandfather, had still a weakness for a pretty face, and Aneth was certainly pretty. Moreover, she was sweet and pure and maidenly, and no one was better able to admire and appreciate such qualities than the worn-out roué whose life had been mainly spent in the society of light women. So he took the girl to his evil old heart and loved her, and tried to prevent her discovering how unworthy he was of her affection. The love for his granddaughter became the one unselfish, honest love of his life, and it assisted wonderfully in restoring in him some portion of his long-lost self-respect. Aneth, finding no other friend in the gloomy establishment that was now her home, soon became devoted, in turn, to her grandsire, and though she was shrewd enough, in spite of her inexperience, to realise that his life had been, and still was, somewhat coarse and dissipated, she fondly imagined that her influence would, to an extent, reclaim him, which it actually did, but only to an extent. There was little concealment in the family circle as to the state of their finances. Father and son quarrelled openly about the division of what little money could be raised on the overburdened estates, and the girl was not long in realising the difficulties of their position. If the Viscount had nothing to gamble with, he became insufferable and almost brutal in his manner. If Lord Roane could not afford to dine at the club and amuse himself afterward, he was irritable and abusive to all with whom he came in contact, save only his granddaughter. The household expenses were matters of credit, and the wages of the servants were greatly in arrears. And so, when the affairs of the family had become well-nigh desperate, the big blue envelope with the government stamp arrived, and like magic, all their difficulties dissolved. A newly appointed cabinet minister, a man whom Lord Roane had reason to consider an enemy rather than a friend, had for some surprising and unknown reason interested himself in Roane's behalf, and the result was a diplomatic post for him in Egypt under Lord Cromer, and a position for the Viscount in the Egyptian Department of Finance. The appointments were lucrative and honourable, and indicated the government's perfect confidence in both father and son. Lord Roane was astounded. Never would he have dared demand such consideration, and to have these honours thrust upon him at a time when they would practically rescue his name and fortune from ruin was almost unbelievable. 
he accepted the appointment with alacrity joyful at the prospect of a winter in gay cairo roger shared his father's felicity because the gaming in the oriental city would be more fascinating than that of london where people had begun to frown when he entered a room the invalid viscountess hoped egypt would benefit her health aneth welcomed any change from the horrible condition in which they had existed latterly grandfather said she gravely our gracious queen has given to you and to my father positions of great trust i am sure that you will personally do your duty loyally and with credit to our honoured name but i am afraid for father will you promise me to keep him from card-playing and urge him to lead a more reputable life foo nonsense child roger will behave himself i am sure now that he will have important duties to occupy him the minister of finance will keep him busy never fear and he will have neither time nor inclination for folly don't worry little one our fortunes have changed we shall now be able to pay the butcher and baker and candlestick maker and there is little doubt the consinors will speedily become the pride of the nation ahem tell luke my dear to fetch my brandy and soda as you go out and stay remember we are to leave london on the fourth of october and you must have both your mother and yourself ready to depart promptly i depend upon you aneth she kissed him and went away without further comment reflecting with a sigh that her fears and warnings were alike unheeded lord roane left to himself began wondering anew to what whim of fate he owed his good fortune really there seemed no clue to the mystery it was a complicated matter even to one on the inside so it is no wonder the old nobleman failed to comprehend it many years ago the cabinet minister and lord roane had been intimate friends then the former fell madly in love with a little egyptian princess who was the rage of the london season and sought her hand in marriage roane also became enamoured of the beautiful hatatcha and went so far as to apply for a divorce from his wife that he might wed her the fascinating egyptian guileless of european customs and won by the masterful ardour of roane chose him from among all her suitors and casting aside the honest love of roane's friend fell unconsciously into the trap set for her and became the mistress of the man who promised her such rare devotion presently however the heartless roué tired of his easy conquest and carelessly thrust her aside although the divorce for which he had applied on false representations had now been granted and he was free to marry his victim had he so wished all london was indignant at his act at the time and no one was more enraged than roane's former friend he searched everywhere for the egyptian princess when hatatcha fled from london to hide her shame and on his return from the unsuccessful quest he quarrelled with roane and would have killed him had not mutual friends interposed time had of course seared all these old wounds although the hatred between the two men would endure to the grave the betrayer was careless of criticism and wealthy enough to defy it the man who had truly loved was broken-hearted and from that time avoided all society and especially that of women but he plunged into politics for diversion and in that field won for himself such honour and renown in future years that at last he became a member of her majesty's cabinet second in power only to the premier himself thus prince kara found him the egyptian had only to use the magic name of hatatcha to secure a private audience with the great man who listened quietly while kara demanded vengeance upon his grandmother's betrayer in england said the minister there is no vendetta the rage i fostered thirty-odd years ago when my heart was wrung with despair has long since worn itself out time evens up these old scores without human interference roane is to-day on the verge of ruin his only son is a confirmed gambler their race is nearly run and the grey hairs of hatatcha's false lover will go dishonoured to the grave is that not enough by no means returned prince kara with composure i must be made to suffer as my grandmother suffered but with added agony for the years of impunity that have elapsed it was her will the desire of her long miserable life will you her old friend deny her right to be avenged a flood of resentment swept into the heart of the listener years may sear a wound but if it is deep the scar remains what do you ask of me he answered before replying kara reflected for some time his eyes steadily fixed upon the floor are there no women in lord roane's family he asked finally 
there are two i believe his son's wife who was an invalid and his granddaughter ah the long-drawn exclamation was one of triumphant satisfaction again the egyptian relapsed into thought and the minister was growing impatient when his strange visitor at last spoke sir said he you ask me what you can do to assist me i will tell you obtain for lord roane a diplomatic post in cairo under lord cromer obtain some honourable place for his son as well that will take the entire family to egypt my own country well in london there is no vendetta crimes that the law cannot reach are allowed to go unpunished in egypt we are nature's children no false civilization glosses our wrongs or denies our right to protect our honour i implore you my lord as you respect the memory of poor hatatcha to send lord roane and his family to egypt i will said the minister with stern brow and so it was that the government remembered old lord roane and likewise his illustrious son the viscount roger consinor and sent them to egypt on missions of trust end of chapter nine recording by ian stewart rosanna victoria australia chapter ten of the last egyptian this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by susanna mason the last egyptian by l frank baum chapter ten lord cromer's reception it was but natural that lord cromer with his intense loyalty to home government should endeavour to show every honour to the latest recipients of her majesty's favour he gave a splendid dinner to Lord Rowan and his family, which was followed by a reception attended by nearly every important personage then in Cairo. At the dinner, Gerald Winston was introduced to Aneth Conanser, and had the good fortune to be selected to escort her to the table. She won the big Englishman with the first glance from her clear, innocent eyes, and he was delighted to find that she conversed easily and with intelligence upon the themes that most interested him. Winston knew something of the reputation of Lord Rowan at home, and remembered not only his intrigue with the Egyptian princess in his youth, but the gossip of many more recent escapades that were distinctly unsavoury. He had also heard whispers concerning his son, the Viscount, that served to cast more or less discredit upon a name already sadly tarnished, but no one could look into Aneth's candid eyes without being convinced that she was innocent of the sins of her father's. Winston exonerated her at once of any possible contamination from such sources, rejoicing exultantly that the English maiden was unconscious of the smirch of her environments. However, as he listened to the girl's bright chatter, an incongruous thought struck him and made him frown involuntarily. He remembered that she was a cousin, on the left hand to be sure, but no less an unrecognized second cousin, to that dirty Egyptian whom he had lately discovered under the palms of Fedra and who had since, by an astonishing evolution, become Prince Kara. Lord Rowan was grandfather to them both. It was not Anna's fault. Perhaps she would never know of the illicit relationship, but his own knowledge of the fact rendered him uneasy for her sake, and he began to wish she had never been allowed to set foot in Egypt. But here she was, and apparently very happy and contented by his side. "'Perhaps I am wrong in my estimate of Cleopatra,' she was saying but the inscriptions on the temple at Dendera seem to prove her to have been religious and high-minded to a degree. Perhaps it is Shakespeare's romance of Antony and Cleopatra that has poisoned our minds as to the character of a noble woman. "'Have you been to Dendera?' he asked. "'And can you read the inscriptions?' "'I have penetrated into Egypt no farther than Cairo, Mr. Winston,' she responded with a laugh. "'Therefore my acquaintance with the temples is confined to what I have read.' But at my school there was a teacher, passionately fond of Egyptology, and around her she gathered a group of girls whom she inspired with a similar love for the subject. We have read everything we could procure that might assist in our studies. And don't laugh, sir. I can even write hieroglyphics a bit myself. That is quite simple, said he, smiling. But can you decipher and translate the sign language? No, so many individual signs mean so many different things, and it's so impossible to decide whether the inscription begins to read right to left, or in the middle, or up and down. That may well puzzle more experienced heads than yours, Miss Consoner, said he. Indeed, I know of but one man living who reads the hieroglyphics unerringly. And who is that? she asked, with eager interest. He bit his lip, blaming himself for the thoughtless slip of his tongue. Nothing should induce him to mention Kara by name to this girl. 
a native whom I recently met, he answered evasively. But tell me, are you not going to make the Nile trip? I hope so, when my grandfather has time to take me. But he says his new duties will require all his present attention, and unfortunately they are connected with the new works in the Delta rather than with Upper Egypt. She glanced across at Lord Rowan, who was conversing lightly with two high dignitaries, and his eyes followed hers. But won't you tell me something of your own experiences in the Nile country? she asked. I'm told you are a very great discoverer, and have lately unearthed a number of priceless ancient papyri. They are interesting, returned Winston modestly, but not so extraordinary as to deserve your comment. Indeed, Miss Consinor, although I have been many years in Egypt, engaged in quiet explorations, I cannot claim to have added much to the vast treasures that have been accumulated. But his grace the Khedive has made you obey, she persisted. He laughed frankly and without affectation. The Khedive has this cheerful way of rewarding those who will spend their money to make his ancient domain famous, he replied. Bays are as plentiful in Egypt as are counts in France. But you have made some discoveries, I'm sure. The wonderful papyri, for instance. Where did you find them? I bought them, Miss Consinor, with good English money. She appeared disappointed, but brightened a moment later. At least it was you who discovered and excavated the birth house at Kamambos. I have read your article concerning it in the Saturday Review. Then you know all about it, said he. But see, nearly opposite us is the great Maspero himself, the man who has done more for Egypt than all the rest of us combined. Does he not look the savant? Let me tell you something of his most important work. Here was a subject he could talk on fluently and with fervor, and she listened as attentively as he could desire. After dinner, they repaired to the great hall of the palace to participate in the reception. Lord Cromer was soon gracefully greeting his guests and presenting them to Lord Rowan, Viscount Consinor, and the Honorable Aneth Consinor. Gerald Winston, standing at a distance from the group, gave an involuntary shiver as he saw Prince Kara brought forward and presented. Lord Rowan greeted the Egyptian with the same cordiality he bestowed uniformly upon his host's other guests. Why should he not? Only Winston, silently observant in the background, knew their relationship, except Kara. Yes, Kara knew, for he had said so that day beneath the palms of Fada. But now his demeanor was grave and courteous, and his countenance composed and inscrutable. Anna smiled upon the handsome native as he passed slowly on to give place to others. Kara, who now affected European dress, wore the conventional evening costume, but he was distinguished by the massive and curious chain that hung from his neck, as well as by a unique gem that he wore upon a finger of his left hand. It had no real color, yet it attracted every eye as surely as if it possessed a subtile magnetism that was irresistible. No one saw it in the same aspect, for one declared it blue, another gray, a third brown, and the next one green, but all agreed that it had a strange, fascinating gleam, and declared that it radiated tiny tongues of flame. It was the stone Kara had picked from the burial case at at Kara. Later in the evening, the Egyptian found opportunity for a short conversation with Aneth, who was plainly attracted by this distinguished-appearing native. He found her curious concerning the chain of the kings, and proudly explained it to her, reading some of the inscriptions upon the links. Sometime, said he, it will give me great pleasure to go over all the links with you, for in them is condensed the history of the great kings of the early dynasties. There is not another such record in existence. I can well believe it, replied the girl. You must honor me with a call, Prince Kara, for I am an ardent Egyptologist, although a very ignorant one. I thank you, said Kara, bowing low. I shall esteem it a privilege to enlighten you so far as I am able. My country has a wonderful history, and much of it is not yet printed in books. Shortly after this he left the reception, although many of the ladies would have been delighted to lionize him. He had become known in the capital as the last of the descendants of the ancient kings of Egypt, and while more than one was skeptical of the truth of this statement, its corroboration by the natives who knew of his lineage, the wide advertisement given his claims by Tadros, the dragoman, and the enormous wealth the prince was reputed to possess, all contributed to render him a most interesting figure in Cairoine society. It is certain that had he cared to remain at Lord Cromer's reception, he would have met with no lack of attention, but his object in attending was now accomplished, and he left the assemblage and found his carriage awaiting him in the driveway. Home, said he, in Coptic, and his dragoman nodded cheerfully and sprang upon the box. The journey was made in moody silence. Meantime, Winston rejoined Aneth and found her a seat in a quiet corner where they could converse undisturbed. 
He had watched Kara uneasily while the Egyptian was addressing the English girl, and now inwardly resolved to counteract any favourable impression the native prince might have made upon her unsophisticated mind. Why he should interest himself so strangely in this young woman he could not have explained. Many a fair maid had smiled upon Gerald Winston without causing his heart to beat one jot the faster. Nay, they had at times even practised their arts to win him, for the bluff, good-looking young Englishman was wealthy enough to be regarded a good catch. But the society of fashionable ladies was sure to weary him in time, and here in Egypt he met only butterflies from England and America, or the coarse-featured, stolid native women, who had no power to interest any European of intelligence. But Anna Consiner seemed different from all the others, not because she was fresh and sweet and girlish, for he had seen nice girls before, not that she was beautiful, because many women possessed that enviable gift, not that she was gracious and intelligent with a fascinating charm of manner, although that counts for much in winning men's hearts. Perhaps, after all, it was her sincerity, and the lights that lie in the clear depths of her wonderful eyes that formed her chief attraction. The eyes, he remembered, had impressed him at first, and they were destined to retain their power over him to the last. And the strangest thing of all, it occurred to him, as he sat pleasantly chatting with her, was the fact that she was Lord Rowan's granddaughter, and the child of Lord Consinor. A remark that Kara had once made flashed across his mind. The father, giving so little to his progeny, can scarce contaminate it, whatever he may chance to be. Perhaps this was more logical than he had hitherto cared to believe. Aneth mentioned Prince Kara presently, and asked whether he knew him. Yes, he answered. It was I who discovered him. Kara is one of my new finds. And where was he discovered? she asked, amused at his tone. In a mud village on the Nile bank, clothed in rags and coated with dirt. But he was very intelligent, for he had been educated by a clever relative who had once lived in the world, and, in some way, he and his people had access to an ancient hoarded treasure, so that the man was rich without knowing how to utilize his wealth. I purchased his treasure, or a part of it at least, and brought him to Cairo. He was observant and quick to adapt himself to his new surroundings. He sold more treasure, I have since learned, and visited Paris and London. In six months the dirty Nile dweller has become a man of the world and society accepted him because he is rich and talented. How curious, she exclaimed. And is he, indeed, a descendant of the ancient kings? So I believe, on his mother's side, for the Egyptians trace their descent only from their mothers. Yet they are so inconsistent that it is of their fathers that they boast. The Egyptian women have usually been poor creatures, listless and unintelligent. In this they differ from the women of almost every other semi-tropical country. They must have been different in the olden times, said the girl gravely, for it is not likely that the first real civilization of the world sprung from a stupid race. And think for how many centuries these poor creatures have been enslaved and trodden into the dust. I am inclined to think that the contempt with which the Sarakans regarded women is responsible for their present condition in Egypt. Have you found none of them clever or womanly, as we understand the latter term? He thought of Hatacha. There are doubtless a few exceptions even in these days, he answered, and you are right about ancient women having had their place in Egyptian history. Besides poor Cleopatra, whom you so bravely defended at dinner, there was Queen Hatasu, you know, and Nitocris, Hatshepet, and others who rendered themselves immortal. Have you visited our museum yet? Only for a glance around, but that glance was enough to fill me with awe and wonder. I mean to devote many days to the study of its treasures. Let me go with you, he begged. It would please me to watch your eager enjoyment of the things I know so well, and I can help you a little. You are very good indeed, said the girl, delighted at the suggestion. We will go tomorrow afternoon if you can spare the time. May I call for you? he asked. If you please, I will be ready at one o'clock, for I must take full advantage of my opportunity. So he went home filled with elation at the promise of tomorrow, and never before had Gerald Winston given a thought to a woman after leaving her presence. Tonight he dreamed and the dream was of Aneth. End of chapter 10. Recording by Susanna Mason. Chapter 11 of The Last Egyptian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ian Stewart, Rosanna, Victoria, Australia. The Last Egyptian by L. Frank Baum, Chapter 11. 
Chapter Eleven Setting the Snares. Kara also dreamed. The girl's eyes haunted him. He saw her bright, eager glance, her appealing smile, the graceful pose of her beautiful head wherever he might chance to look. And he cursed the persistent vision and tried to exorcise it, well knowing it might lead to his undoing. The Egyptian's present establishment consisted of a handsome villa on the Shubra Road, which at one time had been owned by a high Turkish official. It was splendidly furnished, including many modern conveniences, and had a pretty garden in the court that led from the master's quarters to the harem. Tadros, the dragoman, proudly boasted to himself, he dared not confide in others, that the furnishing of this villa had enabled him to acquire a snug fortune. Kara allowed him a free hand, and much gold refused to pass through the dragoman's fingers. Tadros had ceased to bemoan the loss of his beloved tourists by this time. Even a dozen profligate Americans could not enrich him as his own countryman was doing, and the end was not yet. A few days after the reception, Kara lunched at the Lotus Club, and met there Lord Consinor. Later the prince played a game of écarte with Colonel Varon of the Cadivial Army, and lost a large sum. Consinor watched the game with interest, and after the colonel had retired, proposed to take a hand with the Egyptian himself. To this Kara politely assented. He was a careless player, and displayed little judgment. The result was that he lost again, and Consinor found himself the richer by a hundred pounds. The prince laughed good-humouredly, and apologised for his poor playing. The next time you favour me with a game, said he, I will try to do better. Consinor smiled grimly. To meet so wealthy and indifferent a victim was indeed rare good luck. He promised himself to fleece the inexperienced Egyptian with exceptional pleasure. The Lotus Club was then, as now, the daily resort of the most prominent and, at the same time, the fastest set in Cairo. Both Roan and Consinor had been posted for membership although the former seldom visited the place until after midnight, and then only to sup or indulge in a bottle of wine when there was nothing more amusing to do. It appeared that Lord Roan was conducting himself with exceptional caution since his arrival in Cairo. His official duties were light, and he passed most of his days at the rooms in the Savoy, where his party was temporarily located until a suitable house could be secured and fitted up. He left Aneth much alone in the evenings, however, and the girl was forced to content herself with the gaieties of the fashionable hotel life, and the companionship of those few acquaintances who called upon her. As for the Viscount, he was now, as always, quite outside the family circle, and while he seemed attentive to his desk at the Department of Finance, the office hours were over at midday, and he was free to pass the afternoons and evenings at the club. The Viscountess remained languidly helpless, and clung to her own apartment, where she kept a couple of Arab servants busy waiting upon her. Consinor had told Aneth that he would not touch a card while he remained in Egypt, but if he had ever had an idea of keeping his word, the resolution soon vanished. He found Kara irresistible. Sometimes, to be sure, the prince had luck and won, but in that event it was his custom to double the stakes indefinitely, until his opponent swept all his winnings away. This reckless policy at first alarmed Consinor, who was accustomed to the cautious play of the London clubs, but he observed that Kara declined ever to rise from the table a winner. No matter with whom he played, his opponent was sure to profit in the end by the Egyptian's peculiar methods. For this reason, no man was more popular at the club or more eagerly sought as a partner in a quiet game than Prince Kara, whose wealth seemed enormous and inexhaustible, and whose generosity was proverbial. But the rich Egyptian seemed to fancy Consinor's society above all other, and soon it came to be understood by the club's habitués that the two men preferred to play together, and the Viscount was universally envied as a most fortunate individual. Yet Kara was occupying himself in other ways than card-playing, during the weeks that followed the arrival of Lord Roan's party in Egypt, the victims of Hatatcha's hatred had been delivered into his net, and it was now necessary to spin his web so tightly about them that there could be no means of escape. The Oriental mind is intricate. 
it seldom leads directly to a desired object or accomplishment but prefers to plot cunningly and with involute complexity one of lord roane's few responsibilities was to audit the claims against the egyptian government of certain british contractors who were engaged in repairing the rosetta barrage and the canals leading from it this barrage had originally been built in eighteen forty two but was so badly done that important repairs had long been necessary at one place a contractor named mcfarland had agreed to build a stone embankment for two miles along the edge of the canal to protect the country when the sluice gates of the dam were opened this man found when he began excavating that at one time a stone embankment had actually been built in this same place though not high enough to be effective for which reason it had become covered with nile mud and its very existence forgotten finding that more than half of the work he had contracted to perform was already accomplished the astute mcfarland kept his lucky discovery a secret and proceeded to complete the embankment then he presented his bill for the entire work to be audited by roan after which he intended to collect from the government the matter involved the theft of eighteen thousand pounds sterling Kara, whose well-paid spies were watching every official act of lord roan learned of the contractor's plot by means of its betrayal to one of his men by mcfarland himself who in an unguarded moment when he was under the influence of drink confided his good fortune to his dear friend but it was evident that roan had no suspicion of the imposture and was likely to approve the fulfilment of the contract without hesitation here was just the opportunity that the egyptian had been seeking one morning tadros being fully instructed obtained a private interview with lord roan and confided to him his discovery of the clever plan of robbing the government which mcfarland was contemplating roan was surprised but thanked the informer and promised to expose the swindle that my lord would be a foolish thing to do asserted the dragoman bluntly the egyptian government is getting rich and has ample money to pay for this contract and a dozen like it i assure you that no one is aware of this secret but ourselves very well are we fools my lord are there no commissions to be exacted to repay you for living in this country of the turks or me for keeping my ears open i do not want your thanks i want money for a thousand pounds i will keep silent for ever for the rest you can arrange your own division with the contractor roan grew angry and indignant at once asserting the dignity of his high office and blustering and threatening the dragoman for daring to so insult him tadros however was unimpressed it is a mere matter of business he suggested when he was again allowed to proceed i am myself an egyptian but the egyptians do not rule egypt nor do i believe the english are here from entirely unselfish motives to be frank why should you or i endeavour to protect the stupid turks who are being robbed right and left in this affair there is no risk at all for if mcfarland's dishonesty is discovered no one can properly accuse you of knowing the truth about the old embankment your inspector has gone there now on his return he will say that the work is completed according to contract you will approve the bill mcfarland will be paid and i will then call upon you to collect my thousand pounds of your agreement with the contractor i wish to know nothing so then the matter is settled you can trust to my discretion my lord then he went away leaving roan to consider the proposition the old nobleman's career was punctured with such irregularities that the contemplation of this innocent-looking affair was in no way appalling to his moral sense he merely pondered its safety and decided the risk of exposure was small cairo was an extravagant city to live in and his salary was too small to permit him to indulge in all the amusements he craved the opportunity to acquire a snug amount was not to be despised and after all the dragoman was correct in saying it would be folly not to take advantage of it the next day kara personally interviewed the contractor telling him frankly that he was aware of all the details of the proposed swindle mcfarland was frightened and protested that he had no intention of collecting the bill he had presented but the prince speedily reassured him you must follow out your plan said he it is too late to withdraw now when you go to rome he will inform you that he has discovered the truth you will then compromise with him offering him one half of the entire sum you intend to steal or a matter of nine thousand pounds give him more if necessary 
but remember that every piastre you allow Rome I will repay to you personally, if you can get my lord to sign a receipt to place in my hands. I see, said McFarland, nodding wisely. You want to get him in your power. Precisely, and I am willing to pay well to do so. But when you expose him, you will also implicate me. I shall not expose him. It will merely be a weapon for me to hold over him, but one I shall never use. You can depend upon that. Take your eighteen thousand pounds and go to England, where it will enable you to live in peace and affluence. I will, said the contractor. I'll take the chances. There are none, returned Kara positively. So it was that Lord Roane bargained successfully with the contractor and won for himself twelve of the eighteen thousand pounds for auditing the bill. The money was promptly paid by the government, and the division of spoils followed. Tadros called for his thousand pounds and gave a receipt for it that would incriminate himself if he ever dared divulge the secret. Roane also gave a receipt to McFarland, although reluctantly, and only when he found the matter could be arranged in no other way. This receipt passed into the hands of Kara. The contractor at once returned to England, and my lord secretly congratulated himself upon his good luck and began to enjoy his money. While this little comedy was being enacted, Kara found opportunity to call more than once upon Miss Aneth Consinor, who was charmed by his graceful speech and his exceptional knowledge of Egyptian history. Even Winston, whom Kara met sometimes in the young lady's reception room, could not deny the prince's claim to superior information concerning the ancients, and he listened as eagerly as Aneth to the man's interesting conversations, while impotently resenting the Egyptian's attention to the girl. Aneth, however, knowing no reason why she should not admire the handsome native, whose personal attractions were by no means small, loved to draw him into discussions on his favourite themes, and watch his dark glowing eyes light up as he explained the mysteries of the priestly rites of the early dynasties. Whatever might be the man's secret designs, he always treated the English girl with rare gentleness and courtesy, although the bluntness of his speech and the occasional indelicacy of his allusions betrayed the crudeness of his early training. Winston grew to dislike and even to fear Kara, for while he had nothing tangible with which to reproach the Egyptian, his experience of the native character led him to distrust the man intuitively. Kara doubtless felt this mistrust, for a coolness grew up between the two men that quickly destroyed their former friendship, and they soon came to mutually understand that they were rivals for Aneth's favour, and perhaps her affections. Neither, however, had any idea of withdrawing from the field, and Aneth distributed her favours equally between them, because she had no thought beyond her enjoyment of the society of the two men who had proved so especially agreeable. The girl had no chaperone, except a young English lady whose rooms adjoined her own and with whom she had established a friendship. But Mrs. Everingham took a warm interest in the lonely girl and was glad to accompany her in many an excursion from which Aneth would otherwise have been debarred. The visits to the museum with Winston were frequent and of absorbing interest, for the handsome young Egyptologist was a delightful guide. Following an afternoon examining the famous relics, they would repair to the terrace at Shepherd's for five o'clock tea, and here Kara frequently joined them. The prince had brought from Paris an automobile, together with a competent French chauffeur, and in this machine many pleasant excursions were made to the pyramids, Heliopolis, Saqqara, and Helwan, the Egyptian roads being almost perfection. Winston and Mrs. Everingham always joined these parties, and neither could fail to admit that Kara was a delightful host. End of chapter 11 Recording by Ian Stewart, Rosanna, Victoria, Australia Chapter 12 of The Last Egyptian This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ian Stewart, Rosanna, Victoria, Australia. The Last Egyptian by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 12. Chapter 12. Nephthys. Kara's plans were now maturing excellently, save in one particular. 
he did not wish to acquire a fondness for the girl who was his proposed victim yet from the first she had cast a powerful spell over him which all his secret struggles failed to remove waking or sleeping her face was always before him nor could he banish it even when engaged in play with her father at the club the egyptian was shrewd enough to recognize danger in this extraordinary condition and it caused him much uneasiness finally during a wakeful night he thought of a means of escape tadros said he to his dragoman in the morning go to fedah and fetch nephthys here i have an empty harem at present she shall be its first occupant even the dragoman was surprised he had begun to look upon his master as one affecting the manners and customs of the europeans rather than the followers of the lax muslim faith but his face showed his pleasure at receiving the command most certainly my prince said he with alacrity i will take the first train to fedah and the beauty shall be in your harem within three days kara caught the tone and the look on second thought tadros he said gravely i will send ebek in your place i may need your services here in cairo ebek that doddering old arab he will never do at all cried the dragoman blusteringly i alone know fedah and i alone know how to deal with sarah and how to bring her fat daughter to you in safety it is i who will go send ebek to me not so i will go myself to fedah am i the master tadros you think so because you are rich if i knew of the tombs you are plundering it is i who would be the master you are in great danger my poor dragoman tadros who had been glaring defiantly upon the other dropped his eyes before the cold look of kara besides some one must pay old sarah the two hundred and fifty piastres due her he muttered somewhat confused it was the contract and she will not let the girl come unless she has the money send ebek to me the dragoman obeyed he did not like kara's manner he might in truth be in danger if he persisted in protesting no one was so deep as he in his master's confidence but what did he know merely enough to cause him to fear ebek performed the mission properly he not only paid sarah her due but gave her five gold pieces into the bargain by his master's instructions and he brought the girl closely veiled to cairo and delivered her to kara's housekeeper the rooms of the harem had been swept and prepared they were very luxurious even for cairo and nephthys was awed by the splendour of the apartments to be devoted to her use her dark serious eyes glorious as those attributed to the houris of paradise wandered about the rooms as she sank upon a divan too dazed to think or speak neither faculty was a strong point with nephthys however meekly she had obeyed the summons from the master who had purchased her she did not try to consider what that summons might mean to her what use it was her fate perhaps at times she had dimly expected such a change kara had once mentioned to her mother the possibility of his sending for her but she had not dwelt upon the matter at all in the same listless manner that she had carried water from the nile and worked at the loom she followed old ebik to cairo leaving her mother to gloat over her store of gold the journey across the river was a new experience to her the journey by railway was wonderful but she showed no interest the great eyes calmly saw all but the brain was not active enough to wonder she had heard of such things and knew that they existed now she saw them saw marvellous cairo with its thousand domes and minarets its shifting kaleidoscope of street scenes its brilliant costumes and weird clamour and the medley of it all dulled her senses in a way she was really amused but the amusement was only sensual this costume was more gorgeous than the braided jacket of tadros the dragoman she observed that house was better than the one old hatacha had lived in but beyond this vague comparison the sights were all outside her personal participation in them the part she herself was playing on the world's great stage the uncertainty of her immediate future the reason why this tall grey-bearded arab was escorting her to cairo were all things she failed to consider so it was that on her entry into kara's splendid harem 
the girl could not at first understand that the luxury surrounding her was prepared for her especial use had she comprehended this fact she would still have been unable to imagine why she rested upon the cushions and gazed stupidly yet with childish intentness at the rich draperies and rugs the gilded tables and chairs the marble statuary and the tinkling perfumed fountain in the corner as if fearing the vision would presently dissolve and she would awake from a dream she had brought a bundle under her dark blue shawl a bundle containing her cotton tunic the spangled robe and the wreath of artificial flowers the blue beads kara had once given her were around her neck all but one which she had carefully removed and given to sarah her mother for an amulet she hardly noticed when the old hag who acted as kara's housekeeper tossed her precious bundle scornfully into a corner and began to disrobe her the shawl the black cotton dress the coarse undergown were one by one removed and then the flat-bottomed home-made shoes when she was nude the hag led her to an adjoining chamber where her bath was prepared nephthys wondered but did not speak neither did old tilga the housekeeper she saw that the girl needed a scrubbing rather than a bath and gave it to her much as if she were washing a child afterwards when the fat soft skin was dried and anointed and properly perfumed tilga led nephthys to the robing room and dressed her in underclothing of silken gauze and a marvellous gown that was fastened with a girdle of cloth of gold pink stockings were drawn snugly over her chubby legs and pink satin slippers with silver beadwork adorned her feet then tilga dressed the girl's magnificent hair placing a jewelled butterfly against its lustrous coils when nephthys was led before a great mirror she could scarcely believe the image reflected therein was her own but the woman in her was at last aroused she smiled at herself then laughed shyly at first now with genuine delight she could have remained hours before the mirror admiring the gorgeous vision but the hag pulled her away dragging her by one wrist back to the boudoir with its gilded furniture and the fountain as she sank again upon the divan her eyes saw a tabaret at her side upon which was a bronze lamp with a floating wick and a tray of cigarettes she seized one of the latter eagerly with a half defiant look at old tilga and lighted it from the tiny flame of the lamp then she leaned back upon the cushions and inhaled the smoke with perfect enjoyment tilga nodded approval surveying her new charge the while critically she had much experience with harems and wondered where prince kara could have found this exquisite creature for to oriental eyes at least nephthys was really beautiful and perhaps few men of europe would have gazed upon her perfect features and great velvet eyes without admiration the rich dress transformed the nile girl her luxurious surroundings but enhanced her beauty seemingly she was born for a harem and fate had qualified her for this experience the afternoon that nephthys arrived kara was at the club playing a cart with lord consinor he was steadily winning and in compliance with his usual custom he declared he would continue to double until he lost i am not anxious to get your money consinor he remarked carelessly there will doubtless come a change in the luck before long the viscount was visibly disturbed in all his experience he had never seen a man win so persistently already the stakes because of kara's system of doubling were enormous and the game had attracted a group of spectators who were almost as eager as the participants gradually the afternoon waned until at length the prince announced in a low voice that the stakes were ten thousand pounds consinor shivered but with his eyes on the flame-lit ring of the prince he cut the cards and played his hand as well as he was able kara won and the viscount threw down the cards with a white face already he was ruined and to risk a deal for twenty thousand pounds was more than his nerves could bear i'm done prince said he hoarsely bah it is nothing returned kara lightly we will merely postpone the play until a more favourable time when this cursed streak of luck which i deplore more than you do is broken we will start afresh and you shall have a chance to win your money back sign me a note of hand and i will go the viscount drew a sheet of paper towards him 
and signed a note of hand for ten thousand pounds according to the rules of the club the paper must be witnessed by two members so colonel varin and erring von roden pencilled their initials upon it Kara stuffed the document carelessly into a side pocket but a moment after as if struck by a sudden thought he pulled out a paper and rolled it into a taper this he lighted from the blaze of a lamp and with it relit his cigar afterwards holding the taper in his fingers until it was consumed to a fine ash not a word was spoken the others watched him silently but with significant looks never suspecting he had substituted another paper for the note of hand while consinor as the ash was brushed to the floor breathed more freely the pleasure of winning ought to be enough for any man remarked the prince and rising from the table he sauntered from the room nevertheless it is a debt of honour said colonel varin gravely but it is fortunate consinor you were playing with prince kara the fellow is so confoundedly rich that money means nothing to him and he will not take his winnings unless you force him to accept them i know that returned the viscount i would never have allowed another man to double the stakes during a winning streak perhaps i should not have allowed the prince to do so then he also left the club for despite kara's seeming generosity in destroying the note his own insidious nature led him to suspect every man he had dealings with and the amount involved was so enormous that it would swallow up double the sum his father's crippled estates were now worth on his own account he had nothing at all beyond the salary he drew from the ministry of finance so he realized his danger and could not resist feeling that he had been led into a trap meantime tadros had not forgotten as his master had done the probable arrival of nephthys by the afternoon train he should have waited in the ante-room of the club for kara's orders but instead he returned to the house and found that the girl had already been there for an hour i will see her he muttered and disregarding old ebbick who would have stopped him he entered the harem thrusting aside the draperies tadros coolly stalked into the girl's boudoir then stopped short in undisguised astonishment at what his eyes beheld nephthys was reclining upon the divan smoking his cigarette resplendent in her fleecy silks the golden braid and the sparkling jewels she smiled and nodded as she saw her old friend the dragoman but tilga burst into a flood of angry protestations and curses rushing at the intruder and trying to drive him from the room with futile pushes of her lean hands tadros resisted and when the hag started to scream he covered her mouth with his hand holding her fast at the same time listen old imbecile he muttered do you wish to lose your place with prince kara be sensible then you are under my orders the orders of tadros the dragoman and you must obey me i obey only the prince retorted tilga sullenly you will not be dragoman when the master hears you have violated his harem ah but he will not hear it is to be our secret tilga you are going to enter my service and i will make you rich in a few months see here are five hundred piastres five golden pounds in good english money it is only a promise of more to come take it tilga the hag took it but with reluctance if the prince discovers she began but he won't declared tadros promptly he will discover nothing just now i left him at the club playing cards with an englishman go outside my tilga and watch in the courtyard she hobbled away still muttering protests and the dragoman seated himself upon the divan beside nephthys end of chapter twelve recording by ian stewart rosanna victoria australia chapter thirteen of the last egyptian this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jesse percival the last egyptian by l frank baum chapter thirteen the talisman of atka ra kara found he had only time to dress for a dinner with mrs effringham aneth was to be there also and he must not neglect the intrigue he was conducting to obtain an ascendancy over the girl that was the reason he told himself why he was so anxious to attend his plans were progressing well at this time 
The only adverse element was the obvious infatuation of Gerald Winston for Miss Consinor. But the Egyptian had carefully gauged the depths of the young girl's character. She was interested in antiquities, and therefore encouraged Winston, who was a noted scholar. But there was no danger in that. Kara knew more of Egyptology than all the scholars in Cairo, and had often seen Aneth's face brighten when he told her some strange and interesting bit of unwritten history. To be sure, Winston was her own countryman, and had an advantage in that. Yet Mrs. Everingham had once said in his hearing that a handsome foreigner was always fascinating to an Englishwoman, and he had remembered the careless remark and pondered its truth until he had come to believe it. He had a better argument than any of these in reserve, however. If the Englishman really succeeded in winning Aneth's love in the end, then Kara knew how to compel the girl to obedience. As he left his room, he found the dragoman leaning against a pillar of the courtyard. "'Is Nephthys here?' he inquired. "'I suppose so,' answered the dragoman, yawning sleepily. "'She was due to arrive this afternoon, wasn't she?' Kara looked at him with sudden suspicion. "'Have you seen her?' he demanded. "'Am I the keeper of your harem?' retorted Tadros indignantly. "'Old Tilga has been hidden in the women's quarters for hours. Probably she is attending to your nephthys. He eyed his master disdainfully, and Kara walked on and entered the carriage. He had barely time to join the company at dinner, and nephthys could wait. Winston was not present this evening, and the prince found Aneth unusually gracious. She chatted so pleasantly, her manner was so friendly and her clear eyes so sweet and intelligent, that Kara gave way to the moment's enchantment and forgot all else in the delight of her society. Nor did he recover readily from the spell. After returning home, he paced the floor for an hour, recalling the English girl's fair face and every change of its expression. Then he gave a guilty start as a recollection of Hatatcha swept over him, impressing upon his memory his fearful oath. Kara's nature, despite his cold exterior, was fervid in the extreme. He had sworn to hate this girl, yet tonight he loved her passionately. But Hatatcha's training had not entirely failed. He calmed himself, and examined his danger critically, as an outsider might have done. To yield to his love for Aneth would mean enslavement by the enemy, a condition from which his judgment instinctively revolted. To steal his heart against her charms would be difficult, but its necessity was obvious. He determined to pursue his plot with relentless hatred, and to raise between the girl and himself as many bars as possible. He scorned his own weakness, and since he knew that it existed, he resolved to conquer it. Once Hatatcha had said to him, You are cold, selfish, and cruel, and I have made you so. True. These qualities had been carefully instilled into his nature. He was proud that he possessed them, for he had a mission to fulfill, and if he desired any peace in his future life, that mission must be fully accomplished. In the morning he went to see Nephthys, and his face brightened as he realized how remarkably beautiful she was. The Orientals generally admire only the form of a woman being indifferent to the face, but Kara was modern enough to appreciate beauty of feature while holding to an extent the eastern prejudice that a fat and soft form is the chief attraction of the female sex. So he found Nephthys admirable in every way, and if her indifference and perfect subjection to his will in any way annoyed him, he was at this time unaware of the fact. He wished this girl to replace Aneth Consinor in his affection and esteem, and would forgive much in Nephthys if she could manage to bring about this excellent result. After this, he devoted much of his attention to the Nile girl, striving in his association with her to exclude all outside interests. He purchased for her marvelous costumes and hired two Arab maidens to attend her and keep her royally attired. Kara's most splendid diamonds and rubies were set by Andalaft in many coronets, brooches, and bracelets to deck her person, and many of the wonderful pearls he had brought from the secret tomb were carefully sized and strung to form a necklace for the Egyptian girl's portly neck. Nephthys was pleased with these possessions. They drew her from the dull lassitude in which she had existed, and aroused in her breast a womanly exultation that even her mother could never have imagined her able to develop. It may be the girl began to think and dream, yet, if so, there was little outward indication to the fact. 
To comprehend any woman's capabilities is difficult. To comprehend those of Nephthys seemed impossible. She was luxury-loving by nature, as are all Orientals, and accepted the comforts of her surroundings without questioning why they were bestowed upon her. Whatever sensibilities she possessed had long lain dormant. They might be awakening now. Her delight in adornment seemed the first step in that direction. Kara purposely remained away from the club for several evenings, following that in which he had won Consonier's ten thousand pounds. Perhaps he wished his enemy to become uneasy and fret at the delay in wiping out the debt, and if so, it would have gratified him to know the feverish anxiety with which the Viscount haunted the club, and watched every new arrival in hope that Kara would appear. At last the Egyptian judged that he had waited long enough, and prepared to still further enmesh his victim. In his room that evening, he took from a secret drawer of his cabinet a small roll of papyrus, on which were closely written hieroglyphics. To refresh his memory, he read the scroll carefully, although it was not the first time he had studied it since it had fallen at his feet when the bust of Isis was overturned at the tomb of Atka Ra. Freely translated, the writing was as follows. Being finally prepared to join Anubis in the netherworld, I, Atka Ra, son of the sun and high priest of Amun, have caused to be added to the decoration of my sarcophagus the precious stone of fortune given to me by the king of Kesh in return for having preserved him and his people from the wrath of Ramesses. It is my belief that this wondrous stone will guard my tomb when my spirit has departed and by its powers preserve my body and my treasure from being despoiled until that time when I shall return to Kemp to live again. Let no descendant of my house remove it from its place, for the stone of fortune is mine, and I bequeath it not to any of those who may come after me. In time of need my children may take of the treasure what they require, but to disturb my stone of fortune will be to draw upon the offender the bitterest curse of my spirit. It may be known to all from its changing color, being never the same for long, and the color of it is not bright, as is the ruby or the carnelian or amethyst but ever gloomy and mysterious, that none may mistake its location. I have embedded it in a triple band of gold, and it is placed at the head of my sarcophagus. There it shall remain. Since it came into my possession, I have ever worn it in my bosom, and by its magic I have been able to control Ramesses the son of Seti, to rule his kingdom as if it were my own, to confound all my enemies and accusers, and to amass such riches as no man of Kempt has ever before possessed. Also, has it brought to me health and many years in which to accomplish the purpose of my present existence. For this reason do I refuse to part with it in the ages during which I await the new life. Whatever else may happen to my tomb, I implore those who live in the days to come to leave to me this one treasure. It was signed by Atka Ra and sealed with his seal, being doubtless the work of his own hand. Kara re-rolled the papyrus and put it away, pausing to glance with a smile at the strange ring he wore upon his hand. My great ancestor was selfish, he murmured, and wished to prevent any of his descendants from becoming as famous as he himself was. Nevertheless, had I read the script before I removed the stone from the sarcophagus, I would have respected Atka Ra's wish. But I did not know what treasure I had gained until afterward, when it was too late to restore the stone without another visit to the tomb. A curse is a dreadful thing, especially from one's ancestor, and it is even to avoid Hatach's curse that I am now fulfilling her vengeance. But Atka Ra may rest content. I have merely borrowed his talisman, and it shall be returned to him when I have obtained full satisfaction from my grandmother's enemies. Meantime, the stone will protect me from evil fortune, and when it is restored the curse will be averted. Something in this expression struck him as incongruous. He thought deeply for a moment, a frown gathering upon his brow. Then he said, I must not deceive myself with sophistries. What if the curse is already working, and because of it the English girl has turned my strength to weakness? But that cannot be. Whenever I have worn this ring, I have mastered all difficulties and triumphed as I desired, and I will triumph in my undertaking tonight. In spite of the reproach I can already see in Aneth's eyes, I am still the controller of my own destiny, as well as the destinies of others, for if the talisman did so much for Atka Ra as he claims, it will surely prove stronger than any curse. 
With a laugh, he shook off the uncanny feeling that had for the moment oppressed him and went to the club. End of chapter 13「Chapter Fourteen of the Last Egyptian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jesse Percival. The Last Egyptian by L. Frank Baum. Chapter Fourteen. Rogues, Ancient and Modern. Consinor arrived early at the Lotus Club and took his seat at a small table facing the doorway where he whiled away the time by playing solitaire. Presently, Kara entered and greeted him cordially, seeming to be in an especially happy mood. "'Well, shall we try our luck?' he said, seating himself at the opposite side of the table. Nodding assent, Consinor gathered up the cards and shuffled them. Several loungers, who knew of the previous game and wondered what the next meeting between the two men would evolve, clustered around the table to watch the result. Kara won the cut and dealt. He played rather carelessly and lost. The stakes were a pound sterling. Double! he cried, laughing, and again the viscount nodded. The luck had shifted, it seemed, for the prince repeatedly lost. At first he chatted gaily with those present and continued to double with reckless disregard of his opponent's success. But by and by he grew thoughtful, and looked at his cards more closely, watching the game as shrewdly as his adversary. The stakes had grown to four hundred pounds, and a subtle thrill of excitement spread over the little group of watchers. Was Consinor going to win back his ten thousand pounds at one sitting? Suddenly, Kara, in dealing, fumbled the cards and dropped one of them. In reaching to pick it up, it slipped beneath his foot, and he tore it in two. It was the Queen of Hearts. "'How stupid!' he laughed, showing the pieces. "'Here, boy, bring us a fresh pack of cards,' addressing an attendant. Consinor scowled, and reached out his hand for the now useless deck. Kara slipped the cards into his pocket, including the mutilated one. "'They are mine, Prince,' said the Viscount. "'I use them for playing my game of solitaire.' "'Pardon, but I have destroyed their value,' returned Kara. I shall insist upon presenting you with a new deck, since my awkwardness has rendered your own useless." Consinor bit his lip, but made no reply, watching silently while the prince tore open the new deck and shuffled the cards. The viscount lost the next hand. The score was evened. He lost again, and still a third time. "'The luck is changed with the new cards,' said he. Let us postpone the game until another evening, unless you prefer to continue." "'Very well,' Kara readily returned, and throwing down the cards, he leaned back in his chair, selected a fresh cigar from his case, and carefully lighted it. Consinor had pushed back his own chair, but he did not rise. After watching Kara's nonchalant movements for a time, the Viscount drew from his pocket three curious dice, and after an instant's hesitation, tossed them upon the table. "'Here is a curiosity,' he remarked. "'I am told these cubes were found in an Egyptian tomb at Thebes. They are said to be three thousand years old.' The men present, including Kara, examined the dice curiously. The spots were arranged much as they are at the present day, an evidence that this mode of gambling has been subjected to little improvement since the early Egyptians first invented it. They are excellently preserved, said Van Roden. Where did you get them, Viscount? I picked them up the other day from a strolling Arab. They seem to me very quaint. There are several sets in the museum, remarked Pinch, a German in charge of the excavations at Dasher. It is very wonderful how much those ancients knew. Lord Consinor drew the dice toward him. See here, Prince, said he. Let us try our luck with these antiquities. It is quicker and easier than a carte. Very well, consented Kara. What are the stakes? Let us say a hundred pounds the throw. This suggestion startled the group of spectators, but Kara said at once, I will agree to that, my lord. He lost once, twice, thrice. Then, as Consinor, 
With a triumphant leer, pushed the dice toward him, Kara thrust his hands in his pockets and said in a quiet voice to the onlookers, "'Gentlemen, I call upon you to witness that I am playing with a rogue. These dice are loaded.' Following a moment's horrified silence, the Viscount sprang up with an oath. "'This is an insult, Prince Kara!' he cried. "'Sit down!' said Colonel Varen sternly. "'No mere words can condemn you, sir. Let us examine the dice.' The others concurred, their faces bearing witness to their dismay and alarm. Such a disgraceful occurrence had never before been known within those eminently respectable walls. The honour of the club was, they felt, at stake. The cubes were carefully tested. It was as Kara had charged. They were loaded. "'Can you explain this, Lord Consinor?' asked one of the party. "'I cannot see why I should be called upon to explain,' was the reply. "'In purchasing the dice, I was wholly ignorant of their condition. "'It was a mere impulse that led me to offer to play with them.' "'It is well known that these ancient dice are frequently loaded,' interrupted Pinch eagerly, as if he saw a solution of the affair. Two of the sets exhibited in the museum have been treated in the same clever manner.' "'That is true,' agreed Varin, nodding gravely. "'In that case,' said Consinor, "'I am sure you gentlemen will exonerate me from any intentional wrong. "'It is simply my misfortune that I offered to play with the dice.' "'Was it also your misfortune, my lord,' returned Kara calmly, "'that you have been playing all the evening with marked cards? "'I will ask you to explain to these gentlemen why this deck—' which you have claimed in their presence to be your private property, bears secret marks that could only have been placed there with one intent, to swindle an unsuspecting antagonist. He drew the cards from his pocket as he spoke, and handed them to Colonel Varon, who examined them with a troubled countenance, and then turned them over to his neighbor for inspection. While the cards passed around, Consinor sat staring blankly at the group. The evidence against him was so incontrovertible that he saw no means of escape from the disgrace which was sure to follow. "'Gentlemen,' said Kara, when the last man had examined the cards and laid them upon the table again, "'I trust you will all bear evidence that it is not my usual custom or desire to win money from those I play with. Rather do I prefer to lose, for in that way I obtain the amusement of playing, without the knowledge that I may have inconvenienced my friends.' But when a common trickster and cheat conspires to rob me, my temper is different. Lord Consinor owes me ten thousand pounds, and I demand from him in your presence prompt payment of the debt. Also, I depend upon you to protect me and my fellow members from card sharpers in the future, which I am sure you will gladly do. For the rest, the matter is in your hands. Good evening, gentlemen. He bowed with dignity and withdrew. The others silently followed, scattering to other rooms of the club. Varin, as a club official, took with him the incriminating dice and the marked cards. Lord Consinor, knowing well that he was ruined, sat muttering curses upon Kara and his own hard luck, until he noticed the deserted room and decided to go home. The disaster had fairly dazed him so that he failed to realize the fact that as he called for his hat and coat in the lobby, the groups of bystanders ceased their eager talk and carefully turned their backs in his direction. The Viscount had never heard of Hatatcha, yet it was her vengeance that had overtaken him. End of chapter 14